Merry Christmas, Misty Roberts. And Nick doesn't like his last name said on Christmas Day or the internet. What? He doesn't like his last name said. Oh. So we just say, hello, Nick. Hello, Nick. Hello, Misty. Hello, Ike. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas, everyone. Man, last night was nuts, huh? It was so much fun. Dude. It was super fun. We made a lot of new friends. We did. And I'm glad. Yeah. I'm glad that people like hopped on. How about that special guest? I mean, yeah. Yeah. I can't believe we got that person that we don't know yet who it is. Sure. <laughs> it's way before Christmas. Anyway. Yeah. I'm Misty. And I'm Ike. The next 15 minutes. We're going to debate pop culture. My background's in music. My background's in film. I know the topics beforehand. And I don't. We check the internet for the facts. And ruin it with opinions. From pop rocks in your lunchbox. To Happy Meal toys and swatch clocks. Uh, What do you want to talk about today? Die Hard. Yes, dude. <laughs> What else do you talk about on Christmas? Dude, it's my favorite Christmas movie. It is an absolute Christmas movie. Yeah. It is a Christmas party at Nakatomi Plaza. Yeah. It is a Christmas movie. Yeah. Despite what anyone wants to disagree with that. Have you ever been to Nakatomi Towers? I have not. Have you? Uh Uh-huh. It's right next to the Fox lot. I did not know that. Yep. That's the whole story behind it. That makes me really jealous. (laughs) It was under construction during the year that they were filming. We talked about oh, this on the show. We have. That's right. That's yeah. right. I just, yeah, I had forgotten about that. Oh, man. It is. <clears throat> I bought the whole Die Hard series last Christmas and watched all five of them. Or, What's your favorite line? Oh, uh, excuse me. Uh huh. Oh, that was too low. Too low. Let, me, let me try it again. Yippee-ki-yay, motherfucker. Yeah. Mine's welcome to the party, pal. Welcome to the party, pal. Exactly. <laughs> Love it so much. Man. <laughs> I wish we could watch it all right now. I wish right we now. could. I wish we could. We can. Um, I kind of did a little bit of a deep dive into Die Hard. Yeah. And I found out some really like cool stuff about Die Hard. All right. So I think that that's what we do is we just go full deep into our favorite Christmas movie. Let's go. I found a list that just said nine reasons why Die Hard is the greatest Christmas movie of all time. There you go. Nice. Okay. So I'm going to start it off with this. So they used a lot of blanks to do the the shooting noises and stuff. Mm-hmm. Some of them were extra loud in some of the scenes to create um, a more realistic sound. And one of them got shot off too close to Bruce Willis. Ooh. And it led to him having permanent hearing loss. Really? He Wait, suffered what? in his left ear. Huh? He's too... <laughs> <laughs> it works... Every time. Every time you get me with that. Every time. <laughs> He's two thirds uh, deaf in his left ear. Wow. Because of it. Man. You want to start with the classics? Sure. The uh, production budget and the box office draw? Yeah. yeah. You want to guess on how much it costs to make Die Hard? I, you know I'm bad at this. I'm going to say 25 mil. Wow. 28. Whoa. Yeah. I'm getting better. Yeah. I'm learning to equate, like I'm learning to math those numbers out in my brain. Well, I hope finally. so, because you're uh, one of our executive producers, so you're yeah. gonna, gonna need to know how to bid out movies. Ooh. Um, do you want to know how much it made? I think it made. Oh wait, sorry. Two hundred and fifty-eight million. Um, sorry, I have the wrong Die Hard. Oh, uh, oh. I have um, Die Hard, A Good Day to Die Hard here. Mm, die harder, die hardest, <laughs> die. So many of them. I have to type in original Die Hard box office. Oh, okay. Uh, how much did you guess? Two hundred and fifty-eight million. One hundred and thirty-nine point eight, which is a little weird because it, seems low it to does me. because people buy it every year on iTunes. Yeah, maybe that's not a completely updated number. It was, was that the box? Well, that's the box office number. It, so that would have been who the people that went to the movies to see it. Grossing between one thirty-nine and one forty-one. Uh, mm-hmm. Defying pre-release expectations. So, this is also one of those films in the documentary series, the movies that made mm-hmm. us. Mm-hmm. And it, still haven't watched it yet. Oh. I'm, I'm kind of saving it for Christmas Day. Man, today. Yes. When I go home from here. Yes. That. <laughs> there's a whole section, a whole like ten minutes on how 
Bruce Willis was just a TV actor before yeah, this. Yeah, Moonlighting. And they didn't... Uh, and tons The TV of other, show Moonlighting, yeah. 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 And, and tons of other shows, but they mm-hmm. didn't know if a TV guy could carry a, a film. It's always amazing to me when... That, when like you listen to actors tell those stories about you know that that pivotal thing that yep. you know some studio person took took a risk yep and it was now we have what we have tenth highest grossing film of 1988 and the highest grossing action film so <clears throat> you always love the the numbers part of it yeah that's how your brain works yep. me. I love weird facts about things that happened like when they were filming. Yeah. That's always my like, I yeah. can't believe it happened. Behind the scenes stuff. So Hans Gruber, mm-hmm. who is the villain. And in your other favorite collection of movies. Yes, absolutely. Harry Potter. Mm-hmm. Um, so Hans Gruber, he there is a scene where he's dropping down the side of Nakatomi Tower. Yep. Not totally just great acting. Um. He, they dropped his ass. So they he had prepared. It was like a 25-foot fall into an airbag. Mm-hmm. And he had prepared and said, but Joel Silver, the director, instead of going on three, had them drop him at one. Mm-hmm. So that look of surprise as he's falling down the tower is real. Yeah. Because <laughs> he is, just wasn't ready yet. It's also completely unsafe to do Comple- stuff like that. Completely. But... Um, yeah, that look on his face in it's slow-mo real. is like, oh! Yeah, yeah, it's real. It's real shock and surprise because he was not expecting that to happen at that time. Man, there's so many good things about this movie. So many. I, so I don't many. even know where to start or begin. Um, I have another one for oh, you. Good, yeah, I, I'm trying okay. to find a good one. So... They in the movie they destroyed a lot of glass. Yeah, there's a lot of glass breaking. Mm-hmm. So they chewed at it. They had people jump through it. <laughs> um, so uh, at the end, the production total spent on that was about a hundred and thirty thousand dollars just in glass alone. Wow, that is typically the amount at the time that was an entire four year college tuition bill it was a hundred thousand dollars to go to college in 88 yeah 150,000 130,000 wow. for four years yeah that's a lot of money to go to college it ain't cheap it ain't cheap that's like harvard in 88 though yeah, well yeah i mean it's an expensive college it's not a state school <laughs> wait it, it was alan rickman yeah that fell yeah hans Who? gruber oh that's his character name yeah. Oh, got it. <laughs> um, you don't want to know another weird one? Yes. Weird fact. So, you know the teddy bear that oh. McLean is taking to his kids? Yeah. That teddy bear was owned by director John McTiernan mm-hmm. and also popped up again the same bear in the 1990 film The Hunt for Red October. Really? Jack Ryan buys that bear for his daughter at the end of the movie. It's the same, it's the same bear. exact bear. Like it's, it's Not his, the same brand. It's but the... o- his own personal bear. Wow. Like his kid's bear. Yeah. And that's what they used as the prop. And then they used it again in the hunt for October. I knew this, but this list just uh, reminded me because um, you were just talking about all the glass. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Bruce Willis didn't have any shoes on. Yeah. So yeah. they made him rubber socks so he could run across the glass right that's insane it's crazy crazy so did you know that die hard was actually based on a book no oh yeah no i did it's called it, nothing lasts forever yeah it's in that it's in that documentary mm-hmm. you um the book is out of print you can't buy it anymore why because it's out of print a lot of people didn't know that the movie was based on a book so it didn't sell yeah. Um. So they took it out of print. They put it back into print in 2013 to coincide with the 25th anniversary of the film. But it's back out of print again. So you can't, you can't buy a new. I mean, I guess you can buy a new copy of it. I'm sure people have it up on eBay and shit like that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, but it's out of print now. Like they don't print any more of them. There's a yeah. There's used ones. Yeah. 
Wow. Um, you can get a diehard Christmas gift set with has a little <laughs> doll, like a, a squeezy doll, and a book. A with, squeezy doll. Yeah. Like, what does that mean? You know those like rub hard hard but soft rubbery things you squeeze and they like they squish oh a through stress your... ball doll yeah kind of yeah okay it's like a Christmas ornament kind of okay that's weird interesting I might buy this book um well I'm gonna tell you something actually really cool about Hans Gruber again okay so Alan Rickman played him yeah and Alan Rickman like during the promotion of the movie mm -hmm. he continued to tell people um he didn't feel like that role was the villain. He, he one the of the quotes that he is known as saying is, I'm just playing somebody who wants certain things in life that's made certain choices and goes after them. Yeah, interesting. Right? Yeah. He was just like, no, I'm not the villain. No. <laughs> um, I got a fact about uh, Nagatomi Plaza. Tell me. I'm reading this cold again, folks. I don't, uh -oh. know if, I don't know if all this is true either. The real name of Nagatomi Plaza is Fox Plaza. And at the time, it was the corporate headquarters of 20th Century Fox, the studio that was mounting Die Hard in the first place. For budgetary reasons, the company ended up having to charge itself to rent the building. It's not easy to make a, a building iconic, especially a fictional one, but now anyone who sees that building in Los Angeles skyline is going to instantly yes. recognize it as the skyscraper John McLean ejected a band of terrorists from. Since Fox owned the building, they could set off actual explosions inside, so a lot of the film's explosions are real. Yep, and that's why they broke all the glass. And at the time of production, people was, were, the f I think the first sex floors were complete and people were actually working in them. Wow. So they had to film at night. Right. Because I mean, the story is set at night. Yeah. But um, yeah, when you drive on to the Fox lot from Avenue of the Stars, mm -hmm. uh, the visitor entrance, mm -hmm. you turn around and it's right there. Yeah. It's not actually on the Fox lot. I can't believe I've lot. never looked for it when I've been there. It's weird. It's not something you, it's, you know, it's yeah, 88. I so I can't believe I've never turned around and been like, but oh, it's not yeah. on the Fox lot. You have right. to like leave the gate and go across the street. And I don't right. think they own it anymore. Hmm. It could be, could be, I don't know. Um, you know, all the bad guys that worked for Hans Gruber. Yeah. What nationality do you think they were? Oh, there were some, um, uh, uh, I, I don't want to say Russian. That's too easy. It's, uh, something over in the. Something like that. Most people think that they were German. Oh, okay. None of the actors spoke German. So in the theatrical release, they just spoke German sounding gibberish. Those weren't actual words that they were saying at all. Dubin Glabin Gobbin Stupin Exactly. Stupen, so then when they did the home video release, they overdubbed actual German phrases. Oh, cool. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. How how hard do you think it would have been to find like three German guys? Come on! I mean, how many bad guys were in it? I think it was like it was like another three or five. I mean, it wasn't like a huge I mean, number. He, I think he killed like twenty dudes throughout that movie. Well, it, maybe it was a big band. All right, maybe. maybe. You know how many? Okay, this says that the wardrobe department had seventeen vests with varying grubbiness. Oh yeah, for continuity to like yeah. keep making it shooting more and more that, jacked up. Yeah, shooting yeah. a movie that plays, takes place in one day is monumentally difficult, especially if it's being shot out of order. Mm -hmm. It's not that hard, guys. It might seem easy for the wardrobe department to work on one of these movies because they only need one outfit for each character. Mm -hmm. But over the course of the story, those outfits get dirtier up to various degrees, particularly in the case of John McClane, who spends Die Hard crawling around dusty vents and bleeding all over his undershirt. As a result, the wardrobe department for Die Hard had 17 different undershirts with varying degrees of grubbiness. So why do they call them vests in the title and undershirts in the article? Because in, um, in the UK, they're called vests. Oh, I'm reading a UK article. Yeah. Uh, on, on the topic of wardrobe, mm -hmm. I just really must have a thing for Alan Rickman, which I did. You do. Yeah. Rest in peace, Alan. R.I.P. Rick. Uh, so Hans Gruber... Um, the original script called for him to wear what was called terrorist attire. Mm -hmm. What the fuck does a terrorist wear? Like they all wear something different. Yep. So he, Alan Rickman was sitting there and he was like, I was thinking to myself, if I wore a suit, um, and not all this terrorist gear, then maybe there would be a scene where I would put on an American accent and McLean would think I was one of the hostages, not 
So he helped kind of rewrite the film so a little bit. he kind of did that and actually like had these suggestions for his own wardrobe. Yeah. So he went and he took that to the director, Joel Silver, who uh, it didn't sit very well with him. He was like, you'll wear what I tell you to wear. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that didn't Alan sit Rickman well with like, Rick. Okay, fine. Yeah. Um, so then when he came back to actually shoot it, they handed him a new script and lo and behold, he wore a suit. That's the most famous director move in Hollywood. Absolutely. When, a, when someone on the crew suggests something, they go, oh, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And, and then, then five minutes later, they're like, yeah. I have a great idea, everybody. I just thought of something all by myself with no help from anyone because I'm a genius. We're going to do it this way. Totally. And then everybody's looking at each other like, yeah, totally. we just told you to do that. Yep. Um, I have a Alan Rickman fact that I find amusing. Tell me. Every time he fired a gun, he flinched. That... That is interesting. Yeah. In post-production on Die Hard, director John McTiernan found that he had to cut away from Hans Gruber whenever he fired a gun because Alan Rickman would unconsciously f- unconsciously flinch every time the prop gun went off. The, flinch, the flinching detracted from the cold menace that Rickman had uh, expertly built around the character. In the famously brutal scene where he shoots Takagi point blank, you can see Rickman flinch if you watch his face closely. The good thing about employing such shocking violence is that it distracts the audience's eyes from uh, things like that until they read about this and now they can't unsee it. I want to make sure too. I feel like this whole time I've been saying Joel Silver was the director. He was the producer. Yeah. Um, John McTiernan was the director. Yeah. Um, do you want to know who else was in the running against Bruce Willis? Oh, um, I mean, I, I just now realized I have it in front of me, so I can rattle it off or you can. Go for it. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, Mel Gibson, Harrison Ford, Clint Eastwood, and Burt Reynolds. But somebody actually had fully signed on. I think it was they really were going for Mel Gibson. No. So <clears throat> actor director Clint Eastwood had bought the movie rights to the oh, book. That's right. And then opted to not take the role. Wow. And then sold the rights. Right. Wow. Yeah. Pretty cool, huh? Man. Also, Harrison Ford was a big one that was in the running for that. Yeah, he was. And been. MacGyver, Richard Dean Anderson. Dude. Did as you, well as Burt Reynolds. Have you seen the meme that's going around the internet right now about um, MacGyver got paparazzi, found him broken down on the side of the road? No. And it's his car. I think it's like a Ford Focus, and he's really old now, and the hood's popped up. And it's like your childhood's destroyed when you drive by MacGyver and realize he can't even fix his own car. Oh, poor Richard Dean Anderson. Yeah, that's sad. It is. Ugh. Um, one of the things I think is really funny about Die Hard also is that the director changed a little bit of it to try to make it a quote unquote date movie. Because obviously that's a movie that any guy would see the preview for and be like, oh my God, I have to go see that. And women are like, Ugh, I don't want to sit through two hours of explosions and whatever. Yeah. So um, he had to be convinced that Die Hard was even worth making in the first place. And he has given interviews and said that the original version of the screenplay was just a really like grim terrorist movie. And so on his second meeting, um, he said, okay, listen, There's no part of terrorism that is fun. Robbers are fun. Bad guys are fun. Let's add in, you know, the factor of Bruce Willis's Mm ex-wife and somehow find a way to also pull women into wanting to see this because women have the, the more emotional reaction to a movie like that, and that will mean that we've made it fun. Right. A terrorist movie, fun. That's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> and it worked out because they made a bunch of money. They did, and I love Die Hard, and I'm a chick. That's right. There's, I don't think there's any gender roles with, for I movies don't think anymore. So. Um, I think we're about to get uh, slaps here in a second, but I found a little article that um, could change how you gift give give gifts this Christmas. I have something that I think would be fun to end it on. Okay, real quick. Okay. They're making a Die Hard Christmas. Sorry. I, oh, you were serious. I thought that the, you were talking about an ad popped up on your. No, I'm dead serious. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, 
They have licensed Die Hard, the Nagatami heist board game. <laughs> That sounds like it's fun. A, I a, would play that. It's a first for the beloved film franchise. The game reportedly pays a distinct homage, 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 homage to the first film and allows one versus many. Asymmetrical gameplay <laughs> in which one player takes on the role of John McLean while the other players cooperate in the film as the film's villains in order to stop McLean before he can ruin their Nagatomi Plaza heist. And that sounds fun. Speaking of Twitch. We need to play Die Hard, the Nagatomi heist board game on Twitch live and let everybody play with us. We do. We me, do. Me versus you and Nick. Mm -hmm. We do. Um, I'm really sorry about that. I thought that you were referring to like an ad that had popped up uh, oh, on no, your okay. article. And I was like, oh, he's making a joke about I have a way to make your Christmas gifting better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Buy everybody the Die Hard game. Yeah. Um, so we'll wrap it up. Okay. I'm going to tell you what some of the translations were for Die Hard when it was released in other countries. All right. In Germany, it was called Die Slowly. Oh, cool. <laughs> in Greece, it was called Very Hard to Die. In Norway, it was called Action Skyscraper. Wow. <laughs> in Poland, it was called The Glass Trap. And the best one is in Hungary, it translated and was called Give Your Life Expensive. Yes. Give Your Life Expensive. What? That's the name of this episode. Give Your Life Expensive. Uh, like, I don't even. What? Okay. I didn't set the timer. So oh, we're at 20, well, 21 minutes. Woo. Yeah. All right. For Christmas. We give yeah. you extra six minutes of content today yeah. for Christmas. And then Merry uh, Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Speaking of things that aren't free, though, stick around uh, Saturday and Sunday for our holiday mm. Patreon episodes. Patreon. Patreon. You can find the link in anywhere that you're looking at this video in That's the description. Right. Thanks for joining us last night when we went live, everybody. Yeah. And uh, welcome all our new friends. And uh, since it's Christmas and Friday, mm -hmm. we'll see you, you on, on Monday. Monday. <laughs> Yay!